We're MITRE, and we're solving for a safer world by tackling the kinds of problems that no one else can solve. The really big problems, the internet-sized problems, the landing 87,000 planes a day safely type problems, the kind of problems that take data scientists, system engineers, economists, geologists, healthcare experts, and joint mission simulation labs to solve. Safer by solving important problems, like figuring out how to crunch a petabyte of data to identify a rogue pharmacy that's filling fraudulent prescriptions, and then connecting the dots to see how that might be a key to solving the opioid crisis. Safer by solving complex problems, inventing things like new GPS signals, which becomes foundational technology for pretty much everything, and then reinventing navigation to be less dependent on satellites and more resilient on the battlefield, more accurate on the runway, and safer just about everywhere you go. Safer by solving all kinds of problems, whether it's making sensors more affordable to deploy, your credit cards and electronics harder to hack, or underground drug trafficking tunnels easier to find. That's because MITRE is about sharing, not silos. We bring together industry experts and government agencies and academia to achieve a unique vantage point, to find answers, inform new policies, set new standards, and scale it up big so it makes even more people's lives safer every day. You can't count on a startup or a Fortune 500 company to do that. You need a company like MITRE, because we're not just any company and we're not in it for profit. We're a strategic partner that applies science, technology, and systems engineering to take on society's most pressing challenge to make the world a safer place. We iterate, we invent, we model, we discover, we create, we lead, and then we share the answers. That algorithm, those prototypes, that 3D print your own drone in the field kind of solution so that government, private industry, and the world can put it to use for the common good. We're MITRE. We solve problems for a safer world. Your world. All right, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us at uh, for the November Tech Talk, both in person and everyone who is online. I'm gonna give a quick overview of who we are as MITRE, and then we will get into the presentation on Caldera. So, starting off, uh, MITRE was established in 1958 as a not-for-profit. Uh, the reason why it is not-for-profit is it allows us to focus on uh, providing objective uh, feedback to our sponsors and to be able to look at a problem without having to think about the whether or not we will be making money off of it or what would sell for um, for you know the the world as a whole um, so with FFRDCs uh, we have a focus on objectivity and independence uh, focused in the public interest um, and um, and we have uh, many strategic partners, both, as it was mentioned in the video, government, private industry, and the world abroad. So very far-reaching, and we like to do whatever we can to, to help those who, who we partner with. 
Um, we currently run seven FFRDCs everywhere or dealing with um, work from national security all the way to cybersecurity, which is what I presume most of us are here for, um, to Homeland Security and many other areas in between. And we have a long distinguished history from 1958. There have been a lot of important um, techniques and uh, developments that have come from MITRE all the way from the first automated air control system um, to more recently and more related to cybersecurity, CVEs, the attack framework, and as we'll discuss today, Caldera. Um, and we tend to focus on science and mathematics, um, particularly on the problems that have not been solved yet. Uh, trying to find solutions for our sponsors or be, being able to give um, strong evidence or advice regarding the future, hopefully. And we focus heavily on, on our employees. Um, this says we have 7,300. We're past 8,000 now. So we're consistently growing, consistently wanting new, um, new people to come in with new perspectives because as a whole, that, that increases what we can do. <laughs> and allows us to better develop or better deliver for our sponsors. And there's a heavy focus on continuing education, whether that is conferences or continuing to get uh, higher degrees. So 67% um, out advanced degrees. Um, and there are pro multiple programs that deal with uh, getting people master's degrees or PhDs. There's even one where people are able to take a little bit of time off uh, funded by MITRE in order to focus on their PhD. So that's a pretty competitive program, but also, you know, very useful for us to, to be able to continue to develop who we are. And then because we treat the, our employees very well, we continue to have people stay with MITRE. So a 12 year average tenure at MITRE. So on to Caldera. Um, also throughout the presentation, um, It'll be up to, to David and Alex how they want to do the questions, but if you have a question, please an or ask them in the mic so that they can be caught online so that people can hear what is being asked so that they can get the answer that matches up with that. So without further ado, welcome, David. All right, thanks a lot. I believe this mic is on, so we're good there. All right, ready to roll. So today's topic, sleep hacknea. So this is why and how you should hack in your sleep. Um, we're going to be talking about this from mainly the defensive uh, application. Uh, so I'm going to be showing you guys a, a few things today, not only how to hack and why you want to hack into your own networks as a defensive uh, operator in your own side, in, in your own organization, but also a new tool called Caldera that will allow you to do that uh, through a bunch of different mechanisms, as well as some artificial intelligence that fuels the entire system. So to start with, who am I? I'm David Hunt. Um, there's a couple of positions that I've held over, over the years. I've worked in public companies. I've worked in defense contractors, uh, security startups. Uh, I didn't even list on there, but I was a newspaper editor at one point in my career. So all sorts of random stuff. Uh, right now, I'm a principal cybersecurity engineer here at MITRE. I lead the development of the Caldera project. Real quick, if you've heard of Caldera, can you raise your hand? A lot of people, that's very good. So I lead the development of that. We've got a, a very strong team here at MITRE doing this work. Uh, between 10 and 15 people that we have on the team. Uh, I have actually two of my squad leaders here, if you wouldn't mind just raising your hand. So you get that, yep. And Brian Edmonds here as well, who is one of our developers on the Caldera squad. So as you have questions uh, at any breaks, feel free to ping these guys. Uh, they can answer questions just as well as I can. All right, the problem. Why are we all here today? You may have antivirus running on your networks. You may have it on all your host machines, on your workstations. You may have Snort or some other IDS up and running. Uh, you might do Patch Tuesday, get all your Windows machines up to date. The problem over and over that people run into is answering, why am I so vulnerable? How is somebody able to hack into my network despite me having all of these safeguards, all of these protections? Um, you see this with Target. You see this with Home Depot. You have all of these high-profile hacks that are happening. 
globally every day. Uh, most of these things do not get reported. Uh, organizations will hide all of the hacks that are happening, the user data uh, as much as they can. So, so why is all of this happening? Why are companies still vulnerable? The solution, we need to think a little bit like a hacker in order to answer that question. So the very first thing that we need to do is look at defense from the offensive perspective. So we've probably all heard the best defense is a good offense. Um, George Washington, way back in 1799, wrote, make them believe that offensive operations oftentimes is the surest, if not only, in some cases, means of defense. And what we're going to look at now is from the hacking perspective, despite us having all these defensive solutions, we're still getting hacked into. We need to think like a hacker. We need to put on that adversary emulation hat and try to envision what our ne what our network actually looks like to that hacker. So we're going to go through Hacking 101. So if you guys don't know anything about hacking, by the end of this presentation, you guys are going to be master hackers. We're going to send you guys out. We might bring you on red team engagements. You think you guys will be able to do everything that we can do as, as MITRE hackers uh, from the Caldera side. So from Hacking 101, how do you hack? Very first thing, five very simple steps that you need to do. First one's reconnaissance. This is a clear pathway to how you can hack. So reconnaissance is number one. Uh, it's very much like a military procedure. You have to understand the battlefield before you're able to hack into the location. So what does that look like practically? You need to find users' emails. You need to find their passwords. You need to scrape their websites looking for open source intelligence. You need to uh, try to find as much as you can without the opposition, the person who's playing defense, understanding that you're actually looking for that data. So reconnaissance, very first thing you want to do. Once you gain your reconnaissance, you collect as much information as you can, you move on to initial access. At that point, this is where the actual hacking comes. You guys have seen Mr. Robot. This is where all the action happens. Uh, you are actually going to get your first foothold into the system. You're going to use the information that you gain through reconnaissance, and you're going to get that first foothold. You're going to compromise a machine or many machines, and then you're going to move on to one of three different steps. You're either going to gain persistence, and you're going to do that in order to ensure that that foothold you have doesn't go away. You're going to laterally move to as many machines as you can, or you're going to try to exfil data out of the compromised machines that you got. Now, these could happen in any number of orders, and this is a process that could happen over an extended amount of time or a short amount of time. In my career, I've done red teaming for a variety of organizations, such as uh, FireEye, one of the most recent that I, that I worked at. Uh, and the process is always the same. The timeline is what changes. You, may, you might try to compromise a network with the idea being you're going to start exfilling data one year in the future. That might be a very normal thing to do in the real world. You might send beacons out from that network after you gain a foothold every month. That could be very realistic. If you're doing a red team engagement and you just want to test a compromised system, you might have to speed that up into a three-day exercise. And you might have to roll through all of these steps. Your odds of getting caught go through the roof, but you're performing a different kind of exercise. But this is how you hack. This is the process. And because of that, we're going to walk through an example. Uh, so starting off with our hacker here uh, on the left side, the very first step, we're going to perform reconnaissance and we're gonna look for email addresses of target users of a system that we wanna compromise. This is a very common step. I do this a lot. There's a lot of tools that you can use online, uh, such as the Harvester that will look for email addresses for specific companies. So a lot of times you might wanna do that because you want to find, say, an email address of a systems administrator. It's an important email to get. You might do this because you wanna understand the format of the company's emails. You wanna know if, it's bob at company.com, or is it bob period last name at company.com? That information is important because if I can understand the format of the company's emails, now I can kind of guess what the CEO's email is. I can start guessing at what the emails that are protected are that I otherwise wouldn't be able to find on the internet. Uh, so that's the kind of recon that I'm doing in this example. I find bob at company.com. That's the email. That's the guy that I want to attack. So then in my second step of my hack here, I'm going to send Bob a spear phishing email. So this could be any number of things. There's a lot of ways you can do this. Happy Bob is sitting there. He's checking his inbox. He gets his spear phishing email. He doesn't know it. And he clicks on it, sending the hacker through now upset Bob, targeting uh, or landing the hacker inside of the company network. So Bob's unhappy, but this is an example of doing that initial access. Quite easy to do. There's a variety of ways you can do it outside of spear phishing. 
That be, that is a very common way of doing it, but there are things like rubber duckies that you can plug into computers to gain that initial foothold, um, a, whole, a whole number of ways. So let's review what happened here. So we performed recon, we we're able to gain an, an email address. We we're able to use that email address to pivot into the network by sending a spear phishing email. So you guys are all hackers at this point, right? We, we figured it out, we know how to do this. You guys can go home, you learn something today. So that's very good. Now there's three other categories here that we could do. Now that we're into the system, how do we decide which one of these we wanna do next? So as a hacker, I might go into a network and once I'm in, which one of these I do next is going to vary based on what my mission is. Is the most important thing to me gaining persistence and staying in the network? Is it getting as many footholds as possible so I can move around and try to find the target machine that I want? Maybe I'm after the mail server. Maybe I'm after you know the, the domain controller to get credentials. Uh, or is my goal just to exfil as much data as possible? Which is a very common goal of threat actors. They might want to destroy as much data after stealing it and or encrypting it, which is gonna be part of our demo later. We'll show you that. So in order to answer what we're going to do next, we need to do another one-on-one. -on -one. So we're, all, we're already master hackers. We're now gonna dive into artificial intelligence in order to be data scientists, because I think, I think we have a smart enough group in this room to handle this. So AI 101, imagine all of your decisions that you make are laid out on a chain. Now, this is gonna be a very important concept as we move forward. So I'm putting this at the beginning of our AI portion. So this is our chain, this is our decision chain. Every time we make a decision, a new link shows up on the chain. So don't think of this in the security sense, think of this in the very abstract, you're making daily decisions kind of sense. So each time we make a decision, a link goes on. Now this chain, what happens as we move forward might impact what we can do on the next step. And we'll talk about that in a minute. The chain is very linear though. We're doing one thing at a time and we're making a decision, therefore making our chain grow. And we hold on to a history. We know what we did. We know what the results of a decision were as we track that. Now let's take this a little step, a step further. So now we're gonna dive into a version, a sector, if you will, of artificial intelligence called automated planning. Now this is the type of AI and or machine learning, depending on which buzzword you like, that we do inside of Caldera. So we do decision-making based on automated planning. Now this is a little bit more of a complex uh, situation, but I think you guys can handle this one. Uh, so let's say that you want to eat breakfast in the morning. The starting point is you wake up. So you wake up in the morning, your goal, end goal is to eat breakfast. Now, what I have outlined here are a number of paths, a number of decisions that you could make that would end up with you eating breakfast at the end. Some of these aren't going to work and you won't be able to eat breakfast. But as you make a decision, such as I want to get a bowl, now, I got my bowl. Now, at that point, I can make two decisions. I can get milk or I can get the cereal. Say I get the cereal. Now I have one decision I can make. I'm forced into that one decision. And you can see these links starting to filter in at this point. Finally, I achieved my goal and I was able to eat breakfast. Now, as you notice on this chart, one thing's going to stick out, which is if I had chosen get a leash, if that was my first decision, what would have happened? I would not have eaten breakfast this day. Um, so that's one thing that you should know. Now, what does that tell you? That should tell you that the decision that you make will impact the next decision that you're capable of making. So if I didn't get a bowl on that very first step, or if I did get a bowl, sorry, if I got a bowl on that first step, I could no longer get a leash and I can no longer turn on the TV. So now my future decisions are being shaped by my current decision or my past decisions, depending on how far in the chain you are. Now we're gonna kind of transition the thought process a little bit to everybody's favorite casino game, blackjack. So this is part of the decision-making process. 312 cards in a typical blackjack game. So before I dive into this, actually, I'm gonna describe why I chose blackjack. So when I was a software engineer, I was an engineer for a, a market research firm called Vernon Research Group. And when I was there, the very first assignment I got was to determine the ideal shuffle point in the game of blackjack, six decks. And through that process, you learn how to count cards. You learn what the strategies are, when's the best time to cut the cards and so forth. So what we're gonna do here, another kind of 101, we're actually gonna all learn how to count cards really quickly. It's gonna be really fast. You don't have to worry about it. So 312 cards in a six deck game of blackjack. 
easy enough. So 52 times six, that's what you end up with. Now, let's look at the rules of card counting. Cards two to six, as they come out of the chute and then dealt out, are worth one point. Cards 10 through ace are worth minus one points, and seven to nine you can ignore, and there's zero points. The reason why we have this as our mechanism is the greater, when a deck has more high cards than low cards, the dealer has a higher chance, significantly higher chance of busting, which means that you as a player have a much, much higher chance of winning. So if there are a lot of large um, cards or card values in the deck, you have a much better shot of winning that game. So you want to reward every time that one of the small ones comes out because you know that the deck is getting stacked in your favor. And so you, you do this pointing and what we're trying to figure out as the game's going, we're watching every card that comes out and we're doing this mental math and we're dividing the number of decks that are remaining in the card or in the, uh, in the shoot by whatever the count is in order to get what's called the true count. Now, first card comes out. What is the, what is the count right now? Minus one, exactly. So this is going to be a very unlucky gambler at the moment because they're getting all of these high cards tossed out at them. A couple in a pair there, the dealer's dealing them out, and all of a sudden we have a minus 10 count. Now that sounds really bad out of the gate, but now as a gambler, we need to sit back and we need to say, okay, well, how bad is it at this point? Now we do our mental math. We say, okay, well, there's 5.8% of uh, you know, five or sorry, 5.8 decks remaining. So we do our math and we say, okay, well, the true count is minus 1.7. So that's our true count. As a gambler, we want to wait until the count gets to a certain amount. Again, this depends on what our mission is. And once the true count gets up to say five or 10, then we're going to start increasing our bets because our odds of winning that hand go up. So this is a very good example of every decision, every card that comes out of the shoot is impacting the possibilities that exist within the deck. And we're going to carry this over into hacking and doing it in an automatic way pretty quickly. Uh, so before we do that, let's think of links as abilities now. So we've already decided that a decision is equal to a link. We kind of came to that conclusion. Now, let's say that a link is equal to an ability. So an example of that, going back to our hacker, one ability might be the ability to persist. That could be a link. We call them abilities. Another one could be moving laterally. And then finally... You could have a link that exfills data. So now that we kind of get that concept, these are possibilities that we can do. We're going to look at a potential hacker. Now, this hacker's goal is to steal data that's sensitive out of a target network. So we can see here that uh, this bad actor has probably a dozen different potential abilities, decisions that we want to make, but we have not made yet. So the very first thing that the hacker may do may pull a decision out of its potential list, its bag of, of tricks, and it might say, the first thing I'm gonna do is find files. So I cannot steal a file that's sensitive unless I know what a sensitive file is. So there's a dependency that's automatic there. So the very first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna look for sensitive files. I gotta understand that. Now that may open up my ability to do other things. So the second thing I might do is stage files. Now a very common hacker technique is to not just go into a network and steal files left and right, but I'm going to do what's called stage files. I'm going to move those files one by one into one location. That way I can steal that at one time instead of doing it all through the network, which is much more likely to get caught. Uh, I can then after I stage them, I can do what the next thing would be, sorry, which is compress the files. Uh, this is why I want to move them, stage them into one location, is the compressing allows me to take that one location, say it's 10 megabytes, compress it down to one megabyte. Now when I steal that, it's going to be much smaller, again, less noticeable, and maybe I trim out the stuff that I don't want to steal. Maybe there's Word docs in there I don't care about. Finally, once I compress the files, I'm going to go ahead and actually ac uh, actuate through my stealing phase. So I'm pulling these abilities out, and you can kind of see how each one that's made, each link that's going on the chain, is unlocking other abilities that I can then do. Now, that's the chain. And the question here is, from the defensive side, can you detect any of these? These, and we'll go through this when we do a demonstration of this to kind of show what it looks like to detect this. But if you look at each of these decisions individually as a defensive operator, maybe you're on a blue team playing defense, 
can you notice that these sequence of abilities that are used in succession are a bad actor in your network doing things such as stealing sensitive files? We'll kind of solve that as we roll through, but I want to put your mindset into that of a hacker, which takes us to the next thing, which is how do you catch a hacker? So we know how to hack. We're experts on artificial intelligence. All of this stuff is solved. We're, we're good about that. We're MITRE. We know how to do that, right? Now, the next thing is how do you actually catch this hacker? He's in the network, um, stealing files, making these decisions left and right automatically. We need to understand how to catch them in order for us to pretend like we're the hacker in any kind of automated sense. That's where the pyramid of pain comes in. Has anybody heard of this? Familiar with this? All right, we got a number of you. So for those that don't know, I'm going to go through a little bit of an explanation of this. Um, the period of pain is the level of difficulty a hacker is going to go through in order to actuate through these categories. So for a hacker to change, we'll start off at the bottom here. So as a hacker to... For a, for a hacker to change the hash value of a piece of malware they're using to hack your network is very easy. Um, it's an easy thing from a defensive side to catch. You can hash every file in your network, you can track them, you can find bad hashes, and you can knock them out. It's also very easy from the defensive side for them to just switch the file hashes. Uh, we're gonna show you how they're running soon. We dynamically compile our payloads every time they're downloaded, so they get a different file hash. It's very easy for us to do. Going up the chain here, we can say, okay, well, maybe IP addresses. Is that difficult for an attacker to change? Um, I might, as an attacker, set up a command and control center in AWS. It's easy enough to do. I can do, if you're familiar with AWS, I can do dynamic IP addresses. I can change those left and right. So if a defensive operator sees that I am connecting to a command and control center at a specific IP, they can block that. Again, easy for the defense to do. But also from the attacker, I can just say, okay, well, I'll just stand up a new IP address, send all my traffic that way. Moving all the way up, we'll get tools. Now, an attacker might use a tool like Mimikatz. Uh, we're all pretty familiar with that, I'm sure. Uh, credential dumping tool on Windows primarily. Um, the, the attacker may use that. Now, they, that might become a critical part of their infrastructure, of their attacking tool set. It's harder for them to change that. That is a a tool that there may only be a certain amount of open source tools that are legit enough to successfully dump credentials off of, off of a machine. So now if a, from the defensive side, we're able to catch that, we can start blocking that tool from being installed, downloaded. We can you know, catch flags that are in that, that sort of thing. Um, that becomes a lot tougher for the, the adversary to move around. Now, the final thing that is at the top of the pyramid are the tactics, techniques, and procedures. These are the things that are the hardest for the adversary to change. These are behaviors. So an adversary may have a tactic of lateral movement and a technique of credential dumping. Now we're looking at this from a very abstract sense, and that is very difficult for them to change because they may need to dump credentials to move laterally. Now we haven't identified in that the specific way they're doing it. We only know that they dump credentials, and then they laterally move. So we created a behavior chain. We know what their ability links are going to be. We just don't know the actual commands yet that they might do. Those can change all the time. And that's where attack comes in. So MITRE talks, so we have to have the attack slide. And so we have one attack slide for you, and that's all. <laughs> that's a promise. So the attack matrix. So we're going to build on this as we as we move forward. So it's important that we, we all ha at least have a high-level view of the tactics and techniques here. So it's very small, but across the top, you're going to notice the tactics. These are, this isn't uh, the most up-to-date chart. We don't have impact on here, uh, but this is a pretty good look at the tactics that an adversary could use in order to start their attack. So we looked at lateral movement. We talked about that one. Another one might be uh, discovery. So that's a, a popular one. This is a reconnaissance thing that an attacker may do once they're in your network. So discovery is a tactic. They, they might look for every username that's on the computer as part of a discovery tactic. So that would be your technique at that level. Now, how do they actually, what command do they run to find all those users? Well, that can change. That's the P, that's the procedure. There's maybe 300 ways for them to get the usernames. Well, that's a tougher thing from the defensive side to catch, but we don't have to focus that fine grained yet. We just have to understand what that technique is. We, we know they're looking for active users. So moving past the attack matrix, we're gonna do a quick check before we move on. We know how to hack, figure that out. We know how a hacker makes decisions. So we're, like I said, we're, we're experts in AI. We also now know how to stop hackers. 
So what's the problem? We should be able to like leave this room now, protect every network that's out there and have no issues. The problem is we need some way to do that. If we sit back and we say we have maybe 30 people sitting right here, we all leave this room. We're expert hackers. We go back to our organizations and we say, hey, look, I know not only how to hack, I know how to stop hackers and I know exactly how they think so I can predict their next move. If that were all true, we go out, we protect our own organizations. Now our day job is doing exactly that. Now what happens if five attackers come into your network and they're all attacking you at the same time? Can I keep up with them manually? Absolutely not. There's going to be a million holes in this whole process and we're never going to be able to keep up with that, which brings a new tool, kind of, kind of new tool, we'll talk about that, to the table. Now we all, for the most part, have heard of Caldera and we're going to talk through how Caldera can help solve some of these problems. Um, and we'll talk about what it is. So very first, it's a framework for automated red team emulation. So you can use Caldera in order to actually run red team exercises. You can use them to do what's called adversary emulation, if you've heard that phrase. Um, there's, a, there's a bunch of different use cases. So what do you get within Caldera? You're going to get a website to launch your operations. The website will be your command and control center. This is where everything happens you're going to get agents that can be deployed on the computers you want to test. So maybe you want to test that Windows machine, this person's you know, Linux, that Mac. You're going to get agents you can run that will connect back to your website, your command and control, and now you can actually remote control commands on them. You're going to get a library of abilities that are based on the attack matrix. This is built in. This is a framework. So we give you, I think the last time I counted in open source, we had 150 or so abilities, links, potential decisions that you can pull out. Good little library there. You're also going to get a library of adversaries that contain a collection of those abilities. So we will mimic specific adversaries. We're going to show one today that you might want to protect your network against. You might be very afraid that a specific APT group is going to target you. So we're going to, we're going to show how you can actually build your own APT that mimics them and then launch it in your network in a very safe way that will help show where some of your holes might be. And finally, you're going to get a library of planners. And we talked about automated planning. We saw that decision-making process as experts. We understand it. The very generic way of describing this is the planner is the brain for the adversary. So we, we have all these abilities, potential decisions. We've got all these adversaries. And now we have a collection of brains. Now we can kind of combine things how we want. So we take that adversary, we give them this brain and has this set of abilities. Now let's launch that adversary and see what happens. What does this look like? If you've seen Caldera recently, you'll notice that we have a brand new way of displaying what an actual ability looks like. This is, if you were to open up the source code, you'll find over 150 examples that are going to look just like this. So the ability is going to have a couple of kind of tags at the top, tactics, techniques, um, a name, a generic UUID, just to make it unique. And then you're going to see platforms underneath. Inside of the platforms, you're going to see all of the supported platforms that Caldera has at the moment. So we support pretty much all of the IP space. So you can do anything on Mac OSs, uh, any type of Linux. We do Raspberry Pis, that sort of thing, and Windows. Under each of those platforms, we have what's a what we call an executor. This is going to be the application that's used to run a command. So as an example, you can see under Windows, we have PSH for PowerShell. We also support things like open source PowerShell, command line, uh, shell code, you can run on any operating system, thanks to Alex Manners down there with the, the shell code executors that he built in. Um, on Mac and Linux, you can run sh commands. So pretty much if you open a terminal, you'll be able to run any of those commands uh, through that. This ability you'll see is uh, getting process information for a running user. You can see the actual commands that will run if we were to run this within Caldera. Moving on, you'll get a list, or sorry, a library of adversaries. In this is very simple. You set up phases that you want your adversary to run through, and you just give the adversary a list of the ability IDs that you want to put in each phase. Once you have that, that's all you need to do to build an adversary. You're just essentially picking a la carte out of the library of abilities and dropping them into this YAML. We also have a nice, pretty web UI that you can do this as well, but I'm kind of showing that back end library that you can very quickly build these adversary profiles. And finally, we have our library of planners. So this is bring your own planner, kind of fun, right? So you can actually uh, design your own if you're familiar with Python at all. The planner is again, the brain. Um, these are, our architecture is designed around you being able to write your own, plug it into the system, test out your own decision-making processes. 
Um, planners will add links or decisions, abilities to a chain that's happening during the operation. So this is where you're actually able to manipulate the operation and what's going to happen in what order. You create a planner that's custom for however you want to make decisions. Maybe a planner emphasizes lateral movement. Maybe it emphasizes persistence, data, exfil. You kind of decide as you write your planner. And you can create as many planners as you want, and you can just switch them in and out as you're running operations. All right, what can you do with Caldera? You can plan and organize a campaign. This is a big one. Maybe you want to just, you're running red team operations, you're used to doing it very manually, and you want to uh, step back, you want to introduce Caldera, and you just want to use it to plan things. It's a very effective planning tool. You can build out an adversary and say, this is what we're going to do during the operation. This is our rules of engagement, or a portion of it, essentially. You can run continuous automated red team assessments. This is a big one. This is probably our biggest case is setting Caldera up, hitting a go button every day and saying what happened in the network today. Uh, this is really effective for lazy system administrators. I've been a sysadmin. I know how easy it is to be lazy. And one day they may accidentally open a firewall rule or just open it up for a short period, forget to shut it, whatever the reason. And if you have Caldera running every day, and all of a sudden it's able to move from computer A to computer B through that firewall, you know there's an issue. And if you're running that test every day and Caldera is able to make that move and alert you on it, well, now you've understood something before the adversary is able to find that uh, exact same error that the, the sysadmin made. Third way, use it in red team engagements as a C2 tool. If you're familiar, as I assume everybody is with Metasploit, you, you're familiar with things like reverse shells, um, interpreter, that sort of thing. Caldera has a plugin built into it called Terminal that will allow you to pop open reverse shells on compromised computers in a very easy to use way. Um, and it supports all platforms. And that's another payload that dynamically compiles with a different hash every time it's downloaded. So we built in all these little uh, precautions into the system to make it much harder to catch. Um, so that's something you can you can pull down, use that as a red team tool. Uh, in recent months, I'd say the last 18 to 22 months that I've been red teaming, I've noticed that running a lot of the off-the-shelf red team tools have been getting caught. That's had to be a, it's starting to become a white card event where you have to say, all right, we get a white card initial access because the interpreter payloads, even if I encoded them 15 times, are getting caught. So this is a way around that. We've had a lot of success with this. So it's a, it's a replacement tool that you can use if you want to open up reverse shells. And again, you can train. So blue and red teams, you can use this as a training tool. I like it as a training tool. I, I come from the red side, so I like it as a training tool for the red teams. Uh, you have a lot of younger people coming up in red teaming. They need a lot more experience in order to get off the ground and running. You can walk them through Caldera and show them how a red teamer would actually compromise a system. You can run practice tests. You can set them up and, and kind of let them learn through a tool instead of out in the wild where, where things may go wrong. And before we get to our mission, which is coming up in just a minute here, uh, we're gonna talk about the development cycle. So the entire system is pluggable. So if you were to go to MITRE's GitHub, you'll see that we have an open source Caldera repository there. Anybody can download it. It's completely free and open. We have, that is our core system. This is what you see here. This is what we use at MITRE. We use this engagements. We give this to sponsors, completely free and open. Now off of that core system, you can create what we call plugins. Now, we give you a collection in the open source of probably eight or nine different plugins. Each plugin will add a piece of functionality to the Caldera core system. It's part of our architecture. So we have one called Stockpile, another one called Terminal. This is the reverse shells. Another one called Caltac, which gives you an offline attack website. One called GUI. This gives you a browser in case you want to use that. Sandcat, this is our agent. So even our agent is a plugin which means you can write your own agent if you want and plug that into Caldera. So there's a lot of opportunities for that sort of thing. One called Mock that will allow you to run simulated operations without needing any infrastructure whatsoever. And then another one called SSL that allows you to put all traffic uh, between uh, behind HTTPS. So we have all these plugins. Uh, you're able to create your own open source plugins. Uh, you can create your own sensitive plugins for your own organization and use the core system and never share your plugin. So there's all sorts of ways that you can use a system from a development standpoint. Now we talk about the mission. So here's your mission if you choose to accept it. This is what we're gonna be running today for you guys. So APT33, well-known adversary. They've been around for a number of years now. They're known for infiltrating military bases. They go after defense contractors that have intelligence behind them. 
and they try to essentially just wreck havoc that you can kind of think of them as the jewelry heist where they go and they smash and grab. They're, they're the ones knocking the counters down and grabbing stuff out, uh, destroying everything. Uh, they're known for encrypting. They're known for deleting things, but they only do that after they steal the important stuff. Now we need part of our mission is we need to replicate APT 33. We need to be able to run all of their TTPs in our network in order to see, well, what would happen to our network if APT 33 hit us? What is a rough estimation of, of what that would look like? Now we're going to run that in just a few minutes. Uh, Alex Manager is going to help me out with this demonstration, uh, but we're going to take a 10 to 15 minute break before we dive into that. Uh, during that break, I'll be kind of wandering around so you can ask me questions. We're going to have another Q&A after the demonstration. Um, but right now we're going to pause. I'm going to leave our contact information up in case anybody wanted to take it. And we're going to wander around for 10 to 15 minutes. We will start back up at um, 6.55. All right, see you guys in a few. Oh, it's growing. How are you? Yeah, doing good. Good. There's some moves up there. There was. Create some new slides for this. Uh, You're actually the first person I've ever heard of. Mm, really? You always hear from the fans. Always. It's difficult for the friends. Nobody ever talks about how the genius is. That's the other That's kind of how I view it. It's like, that's hard for me to change. Yeah. <laughs> Probably an after effect of coming out of the red side. <laughs> I never officially worked on the blue side. Right, yeah. It's the kind of the annoying things that you have to go through. <laughs> cool. So I'm going to leave that up and then once. Yeah, I know. 
We do it every day. We're also alive. Exactly. We haven't gotten too much. So what language do you use? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there's a kind of control center. But we have a bunch of Uh, Nathan Plummer. David. David. All right. Uh, it's trouble finding parking, so or finding me. Yes, but I missed your intro. So okay, I did. I did. So so far, are, are these slides going to be shared? Or can yes, okay, good. Um, okay, good. Mm -hmm. They share. Mm -hmm. They're also putting this on the, the YouTube channel. Okay, great. Uh, well, uh, I think you answered my question. I had the same questions about the Python versus AOK. Okay. And is the model going to be like you run it in your production environment, you put the agents on your production system, or is it going to be like you get a baseline and you put the agent on that baseline, which you put it in your network? Which one, or could, is it both or either? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we have to have yeah. And what it will do is it will encrypt the entire file, but it will not have speed. So, if you were to put it in the middle, you would need to go around and set it to the world, so it will take the But then at the end of the operation, it will also go back to the world, anything that it doesn't want to do. So, if it actually creates a process, it will stop that process and we'll back to the network. It will be at the same time. Right. Is it ultimate objective to cover? The whole TGPs that might have covers, or is it? No, for us, not so much. Mm -hmm. For us, uh, yeah. the framework phase, mm -hmm. and, and so, the, and for <laughs> folks who build their own, it's going to be all Python. Uh, you need to do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Okay. You can load as many as you want. Yeah. We have fifty something YAML files. Okay. It's not very promising because I've been tasked to set up a so-called adversary emulation program for my. Company and I haven't started yet, so this is going to be something I'm doing next year. It's not very promising. It's somewhere I can start out. Yeah, yeah the field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, can we, oh, sorry. Did you this to attack the yep. You did. We've used this to attack lots of resistance. <laughs> yeah, so we use this in, in MITRE activities that we do in classified yeah. environments. We run this in you know unclass environments. We use this. We're actually using this to do the MITRE evaluations of hacking valves right now as well. So I when I did the hack the, the actual penetration yeah. of the testing, um after we get in, couldn't move like none of the script at work. Oh, really? right. yeah. Because a lot of this is now are hard Oh, yeah, that's now. Yeah. Uh, So we have to make a lot of files, uh, Java, Java file, yep. a lot of Java. Files. Yep. 
And then we finally uh, catch the one is some of the file because like nothing, but it was actually the one that has a vulnerability, and yep. from there we got a lot of people. Yeah, so yeah I, that can definitely happen. Yeah, so I don't think how much your tool will be included into the hardware system and how it will actually look through all the files to see where the we get into most, but that would say that's actually one of the good things that we try to emphasize, which is we want to, our goal isn't to hack into everything that we possibly can as a big team. Our goal is to create a framework that can emulate specific threats. And so if we design something that would be very specific to different adversaries, so this is an adversary, because an adversary doesn't sit back and say, I have every skill on our side as a hacker. They have specific skills as well, um, and they tend to have specific behaviors. So they don't know everything, you know, right? And so what we do is we build these profiles and say, okay, we're going to launch that in your attack, and we'll show how successful it is. And if, like, for instance, if you deploy the network and they can't move off the computer, that's a really good sign for you because it means that, that if they hit you, they're going to have a really difficult time to get But if you also deploy it and they move 100 machines in four seconds, that's a pretty big issue for you. So you have to get yourself that. And so we would tell a lot of people, which is like, if your system's nice and hardened, mm -hmm. you should see the adversary having difficulty. Mm -hmm. you know, and you, you might even catch it fast and, you know, that sort of thing. So you want to be able to, like, bury it up and run different adversaries to see. Is your adversary always based on the web? Because some of these systems just don't have a web. Oh, yeah, no, no. We Most of the military are Yeah, you can watch everything from the terminal. You can... Uh, yeah. Direct connection? You yeah. have some we have, you don't need a direct connection between even the agents and the computer uh -huh. or the server. We have how they're running, so we have a variety. We have an interface that allows you to extend. Uh, our default communication is the agent talks to the server directly. Uh -huh. But we have an interface that allows you to swap that communication out. So, for instance, we have designed interfaces that allow you to uh, do things like log okay. So, the agent can sort of talk. But not directly, they talk to the logs and they post commands to logs and get hub posts and that's what they And that's not a good So you can swap that out based on what your protocol that you want to communicate is. A lot of military systems, uh, defense system doesn't have very, very much of a connection to the outside. It's all very close. That's what we have to do real quick as well. So the agent can actually find other agents in the network. One of them can get out, uh -huh. which is another really good test, is how we're going to do this. Because if one can find its way out, then the rest of the agents in the network find that one that can go And they will automatically start proxying connections through that so it'll look for, it'll try to find ways out of the network system. It's <laughs> a great thing to test because if you think your system is your mm -hmm. super app, a pretty good way to find out is launch this and see it move around and try to get it. Yeah, looks oh, awesome. I will tell Thanks. the algorithm and see how they can do it. All right, you're all hugged in. Oh, good to go. <laughs> That is very dark. To get your mic on as well, just in case. I'll try to narrate for you. Oh, do you want to narrate? Yeah, yeah. You narrate as I walk through. If you want. Feel free to narrate. <laughs> Honorary Caldera team. I don't know. Can we dim the lights? At all? We only have dark mode. <laughs> Let's put it this way: there is only dark mode. Yes, yes. There we go. We legitimately only have dark mode, so. Okay. Are we going to start?
All right, welcome back, guys. Uh, we've got Alex Manners on the stage. As I had mentioned before, he is one of our squad leaders. He runs a development team for us on Caldera, uh, doing lots of really cool work. He is going to be running a demonstration. I'm going to help narrate along the way, but he's going to be running it from that laptop there. So to start off, where would you like to start, Alex? Uh, let's go ahead and start from the Caldera folder. So as you can see, I'm running from my AV exempt because don't want AV to ruin our party here today. Um, so this is the, uh, the root directory, and I've already got my Caldera virtual environment, so I've already pretty much pre-staged everything we're going to be working with here today. Um, we actually have brought in, just, just for today, one of our internal-only plugins. So you guys will be probably the only ones to get to see this. Uh, it won't be released, but hopefully it will get those juices flowing on what you could potentially do with this 